are listening to the Healing Migraines Naturally podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Leslie Caesar, and I'm helping women with chronic migraines rediscover a migraine-free life. Today, I'm talking to Mary, who runs our awesome Facebook community about our migraine stories. Welcome, Mary. Hello. How are you doing today? Doing great. I'm excited to be here. This will be fun. Exactly. This is our first podcast, so... I don't know about you, Mary, but I'm a little nervous. (laughs) You could say that. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I'm so excited to kick this podcast off because I think that it's going to be very helpful to get a lot of really necessary information out to women with chronic migraines. And so Mary moderates our wonderful free Facebook community called Healing Migraines Naturally with Leslie Caesar, ND. You can find us on Facebook by searching on that name in Facebook, or you can go to healingmigrainesnaturally.com and it'll direct you right to the group. So we have nearly 12,000 women in the group as of today of this recording. And it's a wonderful, wonderful Facebook group where we have a lot of hope and positivity and people actually recovering from chronic migraines instead of most of the migraine Facebook groups are little bit of a downer, right? Because people are being told that there's really no hope and there's no help for chronic migraines. And that's just not the case. So I want to welcome anyone listening to this to our Facebook group. And Mary, you're our moderator there. You do such a fantastic job in that group. Thank you so much for your service. (laughs) It's my pleasure. And you know, I just, to back up what you're saying, like, I just have to say how much it touches my heart like to see the way that the women support each other. Like most of the time I don't even have to jump in. There's so much, you know, I got you in there. (laughs) Like so many people that are like, I've been there. I understand. And, you know, sending healing vibes and prayers and just a ton of support. Yeah. It's a great group. And, you know, I work with women with chronic migraines because I used to have chronic migraines. But Mary, you also experienced migraines, you were telling me. I have definitely had my ha- a handful of them <laughs> across my life. I don't get them as frequently as some of the women we help in the group, but I definitely had enough migraines and have experienced how debilitating they can be. Typically, when I get a migraine, I start seeing the auras, like geometric shapes and lights. And then I often will like, look at somebody's face and like half their face is blurred out. Um, so I can't even see what I'm looking at. It gets scary if you're trying to like go somewhere and you have to get home and you have to figure out how to drive. I've had to have, you know, my husband come over, come pick me up at places before. And, you know, obviously the pain isn't fun. So it's not pleasant whatsoever for anyone. And I also have the vertigo migraines. Those have been more frequent over the last couple of years. And I have you know, a medicine on hand at all times, just in case I have a dizzy spell where I can't even walk to the bathroom because the room is spinning so bad. So yeah, well, I think your experience with migraines comes through in the group because you're so compassionate in your responses to people in the group. Thank you. Yeah, I feel for these women because, you know, I know I read over their comments and stuff every day. I'm in there every single day and I see how many women are like, you know, I had to miss my grandchild's birthday party and I had to quit my job because the migraines got so bad that I had to call in sick too frequently. And it really does hamper so much of their life that, you know, you can't help but feel compassion towards that. Nobody would sign up for that, (laughs) you know, so. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I started getting migraines when I was about 24, and I'm uh, I'm 49, I'll say it. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to own the age here. (laughs) Right, exactly. So this this was, you know, when I was just a young adult, just kind of starting working after college, et cetera, and I started getting migraines. I would get them every other day, just about every other day. And they would start, I can still remember like the 3 p.m., 4 p.m. time of day, I would be at work and start to 
have what I call the uh uh-oh moment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The little uh uh-oh, something's brewing here. Something is about to go downhill quickly. And I'm from the Chicago area, so I was living far out in the northwestern suburbs, and I worked um, in downtown Chicago, and so I had a long drive home through heavy traffic. (laughs) I would start to feel this brewing, and then I would get in my car and drive home for about an hour, and I don't know how many times I'd have to pull over on the side of the road to vomit. (laughs) Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, Really sick in the car. Oh, no. You touched on something there that we've talked a lot about in the group where everybody does have like an uh uh-oh moment. And mine is kind of when I just start feeling like the light is off, like something is going wrong with my eyes and the light feels funky. And there's really not even a word to describe it. Like it just feels off. And then I know, like get yourself some Advil or whatever it is. And lay down. I have to close my eyes or it's coming on, you know, full force. <laughs> so I know one lady shared in the group recently that when she feels that uh oh moment, she has to like go hide in a corner and black out the lights and curl up in a ball. And she just has to, you know, basically hide from the world after the uh oh moment. So it's tough. <laughs> yeah, it is. But for me, It's so interesting looking back on it now because I thought at the time that these started that it was out of the blue, sort of, I didn't think that I was unhealthy. I thought that I was in a state of health and the migraines were a real surprise to me. And I like to use the term being in a state of health or being out of a state of health rather than healthy or unhealthy, because I think that's more accurate description. People like us, when we are not in a state of health, that's when our body is going to generate a migraine, right? So Mary, you said that you don't get migraines that frequently, maybe two to four times a year is what you had shared with me before. And so what that indicates is when your body is going out of a state of health, and kind of getting into your migraine zone two to four times a year, right? What happened to me when I was 24 is I started going into my migraine zone every other day, (laughs) right? So my health was always like on the days where I felt relatively well, my health was right on the line, right? Because then the next day my health would deteriorate a little bit and then my body would generate a migraine. So When I look back, it's interesting because so often we're told when we go to the doctor that we're healthy, right? There's for migraine sufferers, usually the blood work is fine. Usually the imaging is fine. There's quote unquote, nothing wrong with us, right? But what is happening is we are falling out of a state of health and sort of into our migraine zone. And so when I look back, I was definitely not in a state of health starting from when I was a kid, you know, and, you know, no one's thought I wasn't a quote unquote unhealthy kid, right? But I couldn't tell you how many antibiotics I was on by the time I was 11. I have a daughter that's 11 years old. I mean, her childhood and my childhood when it comes to illnesses, (laughs) night and day. I mean, by the time I was her age, I couldn't tell you how many antibiotics I was on children's Tylenol. <laughs> kind of a generational thing. We just threw antibiotics at everything back in the day. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I had that from a young age. I was very, very prone. Strep throat. How many times did I have strep throat as a kid? Those types of things. By the time I was in high school, I had severe acne. I was highly allergic to things, springtime allergy season, I would get nosebleeds, unbelievably severe allergies. My parents took me to an allergist. I started getting allergy shots when I was in high school. So is it any wonder (laughs) by the time I was 24, right? Here's the healthy kid, right? Typical healthy American kid, so-called. And then suddenly out of the blue, right? I'm getting migraines. That's what it felt like at the time, but that really isn't the case. Right. And when I work with my clients, so frequent where I see this same type of history, where if we really look into people's health and we know what the indicators of health are, 
we can see that in people's childhoods, the health started to decline. Usually by the time they were in high school, we can see indication that the health was starting to decline. It's interesting too, because I know in the group you mentioned quite frequently that when you're in a state of health, you should be able to handle triggers like certain foods, like MSG, like loud noises and perfumes. Like when you're in a state of health, those things don't trigger a migraine. Do you mind explaining that a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. So what is health, right? So when we go into the doctor, they tell us we're healthy if nothing comes back on blood work or imaging. That's health. You can feel terrible. Right. I have totally been healthy. there. <laughs> Several times. Like, right? You go in with any complaint and you go through, you know, multiple doctors and multiple tests and multiple procedures and they're like, you're just fine. And you're like, but I feel like death more than Right? How can somebody <laughs> feel this poorly and be healthy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in a state of health, right? Which creates so much frustration. Let's be honest. Like, that's really a frustrating thing to be in when you're feeling so miserable and having people tell you you're just fine. Well, it's funny. I was doing a new client intake yesterday and we were going through her medical history and her symptoms and she went to a a renowned regional clinic, right? So I'm not going to name names, but her neurologist said, I really think you need to go to this regional clinic this big name regional clinic where the top, top neurologists are. And so she made an appointment there. And this was after her regular neurologist had done all the work up and not found anything, right? So then it's kind of like, okay, we're going to send you to, you know, the real, real top, top doctors. And they're going to run all of their tests, right? And see if we can find something. So through great, I would say, hassle on her part because she has kids and she works, right? So it's no small feat to drive to a regional center and the appointments and the scheduling and the whole bit. We put life on the hold for... Yeah, exactly. And so she went there and they did a battery of tests and told her there was nothing that came back. No, no. <laughs> So, you know, it's unbelievably frustrating. I have so many clients that say, I wish something would come back. Right. It's almost like I would wish you would just diagnose me with the worst thing possible. So I don't feel like I'm going crazy, wondering what's wrong with me. Right. Exactly. So it's very interesting. The When we really think about what is health, right? Is health the absence of abnormal blood work? Or is health based on how we feel, Mm -hmm. right? In conventional medicine, when we go into our medical doctor, it doesn't matter how you feel. That has no impact on whether they say you are healthy or not, right? It's solely based on the lab work and the imaging. Right. Actually, health is a state of alignment. When our body is in alignment on the physical side, on the mental side, on the emotional side, and on the spiritual side, when that alignment takes place, then we are in a state of health and we feel good. Mm -hmm. So I like to think of that total alignment. It's like our needle is pointing north, right? When all four of those aspects of ourselves are in alignment, our needle is pointing north, and then we're going to have the ultimate health. (laughs) Yes. Now, that's a pretty tall order to get all four of those things in, into alignment. And mm-hmm. some human beings that kind of set the example of being in total alignment, such as Jesus, the Buddha, different uh, people throughout history that we can see were, you know, we call them enlightened ones and so on. They were in total alignment. I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For all practical purposes, when we are in alignment, you know, physically, the physical body is in alignment. And I don't mean like physical alignment, like a chiropractor getting your spine into alignment, but all of the aspects that we need for our physical health are in alignment and our mental and our emotional health. And, you know, we're not enlightened, but we are connected spiritually. Then our needle is pointing north and the body doesn't generate symptoms. 
When something is in alignment, symptoms are not generated. When things are out of alignment, the symptoms are generated to alert us that there's a problem. And this is a really important distinction, right? Because how would we know that something was out of alignment if there wasn't a signal? Right, right. It's almost like a a physical alarm system in a way. Exactly. And so we can be, uh, particularly on the mental and emotional side, something can be out of alignment. How would we know? You know, it's very difficult for us to connect to ourselves mentally and emotionally. A lot of that is in the unconscious. That's true. So if there weren't some sort of signal that we could easily pick up, that we could easily experience, how else would we know that something's out of alignment? Yeah, that's true. And I think a lot of times, like, we're just so busy living life that we don't slow down enough to even think about where our state of health is at. And so other than maybe like, oh, I don't fit in my jeans anymore. Like, where's the barometer for health, <laughs> you know, right. in modern life? So having a an internal alarm system actually makes a lot of sense. Right. I mean, it would be required for the survival of our species to have some alert, right, that something was off, something was not right. And so when we are in that state of health and our needle is pointing north, but we're continuously fluctuating, we're continuously kind of going in and out of that perfect state of health. So that needle is pointing north, but it gets pushed down towards west by stressors, right? Life is full of stressors. Right. You cannot avoid I have four stressors. of them. No. You have four of them? Four, four little boys. No. Exactly. And so we have physical stressors like light, right? Light hitting the retina is a physical stressor on the body. You mentioned that that was one of your so-called triggers, right? One of your sensitivities. We have physical stressors like accidents or illnesses, injuries. Physical exercise is a physical stressor on the body. A lot of people talk about barometer reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, weather. So barometric pressure changes. That's a physical stressor. So those things knock us out of north. They push our needle down. And then we have mental and emotional stressors, right? So these are the things that we typically call stress, you know, annoying coworkers, the family member that when they call, we don't want to answer the phone. (laughs) (laughs) There's at least one in every family. (laughs) Right. So those mental and emotional stressors are also pushing our needle down. And when our needle is not pointing north, then we're going to experience symptoms. If our needle is pointing northwest, We're going to be alerted to that fact with our symptoms, with how we feel, how we feel physically, how we feel mentally or emotionally. So it's our own resiliency and vitality that pushes the needle back up to north. So when these outside stressors push the needle down, how does it go back up, right? What if we have a car accident and we never recover? Of course, right? We recover after an injury. That's our own resiliency and vitality. That's our own self-healing ability to push the needle back up to north. So we are continuously going in and out of a state of health, right? Health is not a destination that you just reach and never have another problem in your life. Right. Check that box off. All done. (laughs) Right? Off the to-do list. (laughs) That would be so nice. (laughs) Right? It's something that it's a state, right, that we go in and out of. And so we can be closer to that perfect health or we can be further away from that perfect health. And our symptoms, our physical symptoms and our mental and emotional symptoms are going to tell us that. How do we feel? And not everything is going to be picked up on lab work and imaging. Things have to get pretty bad for them to be picked up on blood work. Things have to be pretty bad for your anatomy to change enough to be picked up on imaging. So we can feel really bad and have great blood work. True. So let me ask you a question. Like when you were in your 24, mid 20s, and you started getting those migraines, like how did you come to the conclusion that your health was out of alignment? 
Well, yeah, it's a great question. Because at first, I was like everybody else. I thought that the migraines were happening to me. And this is like we've talked about what is health a little bit. Let's talk about what is disease. With this conception that we have culturally about disease, it's almost like disease is just sort of like an entity. Like there's kind of like migraine, like a little monster or something like that. That's kind of like roaming around and it just like captures, like grabs us by the ankle or something like that. Right. It's right. something that happens to us. Yes. Right. Well, like when we really think about it, where does disease come from? It, we kind of think that it comes from outside of us and somehow latches onto us that the disease happens to us. The migraines are attacking us, right? What is that, right? It's like an outside entity. I'm a kid from Chicago, right? I was raised the same way everybody else was with this type of conception. So that's what I thought at first. And it's interesting, my husband is not from the States. He's from another country. And so he didn't have that same cultural conception. So I would stagger home from work and, you know, I was newly married. I would stumble home <laughs> after driving for an hour with this horrible, horrible nausea and pounding head pain and the whole bit that I would just stagger through the door and collapse on the couch. And my husband would ask me questions like, well, did you eat lunch today? And I would get infuriated, absolutely <laughs> infuriated. <laughs> I can totally relate to this because like, if I get like even a little headache, not even a migraine, but just a headache, the first question my husband asked me is, are you dehydrated? And I'm like, dude, if it was that simple, <laughs> you feel like if it was just a simple fix, I would have done it by now, you know? Right. But what he was doing was, because in his culture, it's much more a conception that when you don't feel good, it's because you're not in a state of health, right? He is coming from a culture that has a more true conception around what health and disease is. So he would ask me these questions and I would get so mad. I remember one time I even yelled at him, you know, you're not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, stop. <laughs> right. Because what he was doing was he was challenging this conception that I had in my mind that the migraine was happening to me, right? Because if I was feeling this way based on something that I was doing, that doesn't mean the migraine was happening to me at all. It means the opposite of that. It right? means that you have to take ownership and figure out how to fix it. Yeah. Which is yeah. always difficult to think. Like, you know, we don't want this stuff to be our fault. <laughs> well, and, and that's the and thing. And I'm not suggesting like, it is a fault. And I'm just saying, like, that's a battle you work out in your head, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because you can go either way with this, right? If migraines are happening to me, then it's definitely not my fault. It's bad luck, bad fate right? Now we call that bad genes. Bad genes is just a scientific sounding term for bad luck. So if migraines are happening to me, I have no blame, right? But if the migraines are being generated by my body because something is not in alignment physically, mentally, or emotionally, well, wait a minute here. It's not my fault, but I have control now, right? When And a lot of people with migraines get really irritated when their husband says something like, well, did you know, did you do X, Y, and Z? And they, you know, they blow up just like I did because it kind of feels like you're saying that it's my fault, right? But the flip side of it's my fault is I have control. Mm -hmm. It's true. And so I have to credit him and his cultural beliefs and me knowing something about, you know, his cultural beliefs around health and disease, that it kind of clicked in my mind, wait a minute here, maybe there's something wrong that could be corrected. Maybe it's not just these migraines are happening to me. Maybe there's something out of whack here. There's something that I could do and we could correct the underlying problem and then I would feel better. So that led me to make an appointment with my medical doctor. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> They're wonderful people. <laughs> they are. They truly are. And when you think about, okay, how do I feel good again? Right? Okay. Yeah, maybe there is something that if I could change, if I could figure out what it was and I could change it and I could feel better, that'd be great. So who do we think of that's going to help us with that? Our doctor, our medical doctor. That's what doctors do, right? So I went into my medical doctor who I really liked. I had, you know, would go in once a year prior to this, really had, you know, quote unquote, no health problems, even though that was kind of a lie. But according to American medicine, I was healthy, right? So I went back to her and I told her what was going on. And I was expecting a full workup. You know, I was expecting like a half hour, 45 minute appointment. I was expecting a full workup. I was so excited for this appointment. And you can imagine what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess. 10 minutes of a conversation and a prescription. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> so I was so confused, so totally confused. And I had a very, very strong intuitive knowledge that if I filled this prescription, I was going to be putting a Band-Aid on it. And I did not want to put a Band-Aid on this problem. I really wanted to get to the root and understand what was causing it and address that and feel better. Mm -hmm. So I never filled the prescription. And I waited. So I said, well, you know what? Maybe she was really busy. Maybe it was just a real busy day. And that's why she didn't spend a lot of time with me. So I booked another appointment the next month. <laughs> you can tell how young I was, right? Right. <laughs> so I went back in a month later and went through the whole thing again. And she was like, I just gave you a prescription. And did you fill the prescription? And I was like, no, I didn't fill the prescription. And she's like, take the medicine. <laughs> I think it's like we've been conditioned to like, expect a certain thing like we know that when we go to the doctor it's going to be a 15 minute appointment and probably a prescription when we walk out the door and on the other side doctors I have all of the compassion in the world for them because that's what they've been taught to do really yeah exactly so I was very confused again again I was young <laughs> forgive me I was very naive but I was even more confused. And I really thought, let me try one more time because I'm going to a doctor and this is what they do. They restore the sick to health, right? This is, and so I'm sure it was just another busy day. So I went back a third time and then she got really irritated. Oh, no. <laughs> and she was like, you haven't taken the medicine. And of course, you know, three months have gone by and I mean, nothing has improved at all. I'm still suffering greatly. And so then she whipped out her prescription pad again and wrote me a narcotic painkiller oh dear. prescription. Now, this was in the 90s, right? This was in the mid-90s. And so this was when doctors would give opiate pain medication for this type of thing. You know, they shouldn't be, you know, now 25 years later in the horrible opiate crisis that we have in the country, doctors are really not doing this anymore. But that's what happened to me. And I have this like seared in my memory of me just leaving the office, staring down at this prescription for this opiate pain medication. And that was like the turning point for me, absolute turning point. I knew that if I were to take this, it would be a disaster. I just knew that intuitively. And that's when I started looking for real answers, real answers. And so it's just really chilling to me, to be honest with you, you know, I've had this Facebook group for over four years now, and the number of women that I've talked to over the past four years that have posted in the Facebook group that have become addicted to opiates or other narcotics because of these types of prescriptions, it's really, really heartbreaking. And I could have been one of them. I absolutely could have been one of them. And it's really sad just because, you know, like I always believe that people are doing the best they can with what they have and what they know, right? Right. And this comes out of a place of desperation, you know, that they're willing to try anything just to have a day without horrific pain. 
So, you know, like we're not coming from a place of judgment on taking medication that you just hope will help you because we understand it does come from that desperation. Yes, absolutely. So I feel for medical doctors tremendously. Anyone who goes into healthcare, whether that's a doctor, nurse, medical tech, you know, there's a lot of people that go into healthcare. Everybody that goes into healthcare is going into the field to help and serve humanity. Right. Without a doubt. And so I really feel for medical doctors because, you know, the typical 22 year old entering medical school, they think that they're going to be taught how to restore the sick to health. And unfortunately, they're not because in conventional medicine, they don't believe that people can recover their health once they have a chronic condition. They don't believe it's possible. When then you add all of the red tape that you have to deal with insurance and laws and medical malpractice and like their hands are kind of tied sometimes. They are. And this isn't discussed when I've brought this up to people that aren't in the medical field. Most people are really surprised to hear this, but there is actually a suicide crisis amongst medical doctors in this country. It's actually one of the most dangerous professions because the suicide rate is so high. And within the medical field, they are talking about it, but I don't think that this is something that's widely known amongst the public. And I can't imagine being a neurologist. I can't imagine how depressing being a neurologist must be because you have all of these migraine sufferers coming in, and the only thing you can do is prescribe a medicine that over time. People are going to feel worse and worse. The headaches are going to get worse and worse over time. And they are totally dependent on the pharmaceutical industry for what their treatment options are. Yeah, that has to be a very like disheartening feeling to want to help people and just have, you know, limited options and limited options is the best word I can come up with. But yeah, just like feeling kind of helpless in a way. Mm hmm. And when I'm working with my clients, I'm only limited by my own ability to help my own skill set, my own learning, which obviously I'm continuously studying and learning and honing what I do, but I'm not limited by what the pharmaceutical industry produces. You know, the tryptin drugs came out about 25, 30 years ago, and they've stopped working for millions and millions of people. So what is your neurologist supposed to do? I've got no other options for you. You've been on this Imitrex so long it doesn't work anymore. What is the neurologist supposed to do? So the pharmaceutical industry sort of had to save the neurology practices by coming up with this new class of drugs that have been out for about three years now, the CGRP antagonists, the new class of drugs, the Amavig, the Amgality, the Nurtec, because how does a neurologist treat somebody when none of the drugs work anymore? They're totally dependent on what the pharmaceutical industry comes up with. And it seems like, I mean, not just in the medical field, but, you know, reading through comments and stuff with the women in the group, but it's almost like a throw a spaghetti at the wall and hope something sticks method, really. Like not just doctors, but like, you know, is it selfie device? I can't think of how they pronounce it. Oh, the cephaly? Yeah, mm -hmm. cephaly, that device. And, you know, there's which supplement works and which, again, it comes out of that desperation. You get so desperate to be out of pain that you're willing to throw all the spaghetti at the wall, hoping one of them will stick, you know? Well, I think that's a great topic, actually, for our next podcast. What is your neurologist thinking when you go into the appointment? Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Yeah, why don't we cover that on the next one and we can talk about the spaghetti on the wall process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think it's really just to, you know, kind of finish up, like I think it's really amazing when you find a doctor in your case a naturopath doctor that like really does understand what you're going through like I personally have always been too 
female OBGYNs. And part of that is just because I know when I say cramps, they know exactly what I'm talking about, you know? Right. So for you, I think it's really incredible that when you are talking to the clients or people in the group, they can say something like that to you and you know exactly what they're referring to because you've walked through those same shoes or you've walked in the same shoes. I sure have. I have been in extreme pain and vomiting in the whole bit. I totally know what it's like. That's for sure. This was awesome. I hope um, everybody got something out of it. And I hope that if you guys have questions, you will, you know, circle back and let us know. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Mary, for joining me today. And thanks everybody for listening. Before you go, be sure to like this episode, subscribe to this podcast. And let me ask you, do you know somebody in your life who would benefit from what we talked about today? If so, please share on your social media. I'm really committed to getting this message out to women with chronic migraines that there is hope. You can restore your health, stop getting migraines, and rediscover a migraine-free life. And if you want to stay connected, please join our free Facebook group. We have a fantastic, positive, supportive migraine Facebook group with over 12,000 women in the Facebook group. Truly the best migraine Facebook group on Facebook. So you can go to Healing Migraines Naturally with Leslie Caesar ND in the search box in Facebook, or you can go to HealingMigrainesNaturally.com and we'll redirect you automatically to that group. So thanks so much, Mary. We will talk soon. All right. Awesome. Thank you.